uh, we are extremely happy to have uh, Ronan Aldan uh, talk this week and next week uh, on the slicing conjecture and KLS conjecture. Um, and it's almost you know, near resolution. Um, Ronan is right now in uh, Princeton University. Next year will be at, with us at the Institute. And uh, normally is at the Weizmann Institute. So uh, yeah, Ronan, the floor is, oh, wait a minute. Next week, it was going to be Tuesday, but we moved it to Monday. So Monday and next week, the same time, 10.30 to 12.30 instead of Tuesday. Okay, so that's, uh, I, you know, every, you know, it will be on the website and everything, but those of you who like it, and I'm sure you all will, uh, yeah, join us again on Monday for the, you know, the real thing. Yeah, right? This is today's background. So Ronan will tell you everything. Go ahead, Ronan. Thank you, Avi, uh, for the invitation, the introduction, everything. Uh, okay, so the topic, so I'm going to speak about uh, Yuan Zichen's recent uh, very significant breakthrough on uh, high dimensional convex bodies. And my, the purpose of this talk will be, so I, I assume most of the audience come from CS and discrete math. The purpose is to give like, not everyone, okay, uh, is to give, you know, to, to make it kind of self-contained, to give some background so you would get like a hunch, a feeling about what's going on in this uh, really nice topic, to my opinion. And hopefully I'll be able to, you know, I have four hours, hopefully I'll be able to communicate most of the proof now since uh, I'm assuming most of the audience is not familiar with many of the things we'll talk about. It'll be great if you stop me whenever you don't follow. So, you know, I'll try to do it like slowly and self-contained, but please don't hesitate to stop me at any point. Okay, so let's begin with this very nice question due to uh, Boozman and Petty. So this is known as the Boozman Petty problem from 56, which asks the following thing. Suppose I have two uh, convex bodies, K and T, and I know that they have the following property. So they're both origin symmetric, meaning that if a point is there, its antipode is also in there. And they, they both have the property that if I slice them through the origin, I take the n minus one dimensional volume of every section of uh, k, this is smaller than the corresponding section of t. And the question is, does this imply that the whole volume of K is smaller than the volume of T? Now, luckily, in the audience here, we have an odd number of people, so we can take a vote and, you know, we'll be able, one side will have to win. So maybe let's, uh, also the people on the Zoom, if there are any thoughts, for those of you who don't know the problem, but who thinks it's, uh, the answer is yes? Who thinks the answer is no? I think it's no, but mostly we will give the reason. It's not okay, good. so two versus one to no, and indeed the answer is no. So Larman and Rogers About 20 years later, in uh, 75, found a counterexample. So may maybe I should first say that Boozman and Petty showed that this is actually true in dimension, in up to dimension four. So if n is at most four, this is true. But Larman and Rod Rogers found a counterexample in dimension 12. And so this counterexample is not so easy to describe, but not so much afterwards, Keith Ball, so in 88, Keith Ball, 
well showed that the answer is not just no, but really it's hell no. So not only there is a counterexample, but really maybe the two first convex bodies that come to your mind are counterexamples to this. So what are the fir two first convex bodies that come to mind? Great, a ball and a hypercube. Perfect. So, so if um, K is a hypercube, and T is a bar of slightly uh, larger of slightly smaller volume, then you will have the inequality star, but, well, T has smaller volume. So, the, can you make the, the inequality star? Sorry? I have a question. Yes. Um, what, what if I put a constant in front of uh, the volume of T? Like, what's the worst possible ratio of volume K or volume T? Is it attained by the cube in the sphere? Very good question. This is basically the subject of the whole uh, four-hour talk. So we're going to get there. But the answer is not known. It's not known, and it's in some ways conjecture to be uh, a cube and a ball. Okay, so this is, I mean, it's a very simple counterexample, but, you know, it's not so simple to check that this is a counterexample. It's easy to calculate the volume of a cube. It's not that easy, even though, you know, it's there are you know, nice tractable formulas with the gamma function for the volume of a ball. But what's really not that easy is to establish that star holds, right? Like, you basically have to know what's the maximal volume of a section of the, of the cube. In order to show that star holds, you want to show that if you cut the cube with a central section, there is some upper bound for it. And this is what Keith Bohr found. He basically found that uh, if you have the high dimensional cube and you want to try to maximize the area of the n minus one dimensional area of the, of the cut like this, and it guesses what's the cut that maximizes it, for those of you who don't know. So the cu cut that maximizes it, yeah? yeah. Like, is there something on the diagonals? Sure. So the, I guess the natural guess would be to take you know, the perp of the direction one, 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 one. Yeah. But this is not the maximal cut. The maximal cut is a two-dimensional cut. So basically this cut in where, you know, it's, it's the perp of one, one, zero, 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 zero. The one that gives you here like square root of two. That's the maximal way to cut it, no matter what dimension. It's maximized on two dimensions. So, I mean, this is a very nice fact, but I guess, you know, this already gives you an idea of, you know, how seemingly easy questions can have, like, much harder answers than we expect in high-dimensional convex geometry. And... Can you say what the dimension is that this kicks in? Five. Five. Yeah, it kicks in at dimension five. Um, I don't know if you can hear me over Zoom. What if you want to, not just volume n minus one, but also lower dimensional sections? Does it make a difference? Ah, if, if we look at lower dimensional sections also. So, I mean, depend, depending how low. So, clearly, if all one dimensional sections are bigger, it just means that one body is contained in the other. But then there's all the in-between. 
And um, I think for most cases, this is basically wide open. Okay. I vaguely remember some result of Clark talk about the hypercube and, and every section having surface area at, at most something. Uh, very decent, uh, there's very there is a result that says that most uh, I'll, I'll actually get there, okay? I mean, the, there is something and I'll get there at some point. Okay, so this is, you know, the, the first question, but maybe now let's try to ask a weaker question. So things are not like very nice in high dimensions, but maybe things are kind of tame and are not completely crazy in the sense that maybe if I add some constant here, I don't know, 10, then this will be true. Okay, so question two, and this question is basically equivalent to the so-called Bourguin slicing problem. Question two, and this is essentially asked by Bourguin, I think 85, Uh, what if we add some constant here? And let me phrase it a bit differently. Does there exist a, con a small constant C such that uh, star implies, oh, let's just do this, that C volume K is at most volume K. to see, I mean, we're not going to see it, but you, you're going to trust me on this, that the symmetry assumption is actually not, more, not so important. We're going to find a different formulation of this question where you don't need to assume symmetry and you replace just central sections by the maximal sections. And second, it's also not hard to see that you can actually assume that T is always a Euclidean board, and you just care about K being an arbitrary convex body. So I'm going to give you a question which is equivalent to this. I'm not going to show you why, but it's not so hard. So let's call it question three. And this is basically the slicing problem as we again asked it. They want to formulate it like this. Um, suppose that K is convex and has unit volume. Does there exist? hyperplane H such that the n minus one dimensional volume of K intersected with H is at least C where C is some universal constant one over a thousand That's the whole, that's going to be the whole game. Yeah, we don't want C to depend on that. Okay, so the picture is pretty simple. I have some whatever convex body of unit volume. Can I always find a cut such that the size of this is at least one over 100. Try to prove it in two dimensions, it'll be pretty easy. 
three dimensions, a bit harder, but you can pretty easily realize that actually for any fixed dimension, you can, there is a compactness argument that tells you that there is always some constant which is the worst. But the big question is, um, indeed, does, the, does this constant have to depend on a dimension or not? So this is the slicing problem. Well, if K is a hypercube, hyper this is true. Sorry, if K well, is... If K is a hypercube. Yeah. Then it's true? If K is a hypercube, yes, then it's true. Okay. The, the minimal section of a hypercube is essentially the, is it known that it's, it's just the one whose perpendicular direction is like one, zero, 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 zero. I think it's known. Okay. I mean, it's definitely known to be true, but I don't remember if this is the min known to be the minimal one. I'm pretty sure it is. Yeah, so may maybe I should say like there's a, there are tons of work showing this to be true for specific uh, bodies. So it's known for like LP bars, it's known for random polytopes, it's known for so-called zonotopes, if you know what it is, doesn't matter if you don't. It's known for like several other random constructions, Shatten classes, uh, many specific examples, any, basically any one, any example you can think of, there's probably a paper showing it's true for this class. But, and does the hyperspace the word conjecture? The conjecture is that if, the, if, if it's symmetric, the hypercube is the worst. If, it's, if you don't have a symmetry assumption, then the simplex is the worst. Yeah. Thanks for the question. Uh, okay, so let's, so, you know, we can't prove it for a universal constant, so, you know, the next best thing we can do is try to prove some good dependence on the dimension. So let's define ln to be just, uh, you know, the worst thing you can get. So the infimum over k convex of the supremum over h uh, over all the hyperplanes of volume 1 show a lower bound for L sub n, okay? So what do we know? Um, it's pretty easy, we'll see it later. I'm not going to show it now, but it's pretty easy to show that Ln is at least n to the minus one half. Essentially, uh, convex body of volume one can be like up to a linear transformation that preserves volume. You can make sure that it contains a ball of like this size. And uh, no, actually, okay. That's not exactly the reason. Let me put it aside. This is easy, we'll see it later. Then again, when he asked the question, or a bit late after he asked the question, I think in 87, showed the bound ln is at least 1 over n to the 1 over 4 times log n. And there was no progress for basically 20 years until Clartag 
in 06, well, removed the log n. Now, when Clark, I, I started my PhD in 07, when this result was kind of fresh, and I really remember that this was, like the impression was that this was a really big earthquake. Just the removal of log, I, over, I witnessed the aftershocks of this uh, result by Clartag. I mean, the, the, maybe one of the reasons is, you know, this is a very simple to state problem, but also in the 20 years between this and this, the community really realized that this constant LN plays such an important role in so many theorems in high dimensional convex geometry. So there is tons of literature where you prove something up to this quantity. So this is, you know, the, hypo the, the hypothesis that it's bounded kind of implies many, many things. So this, this, so this progress was in 06, and there was no progress since until now, where Chen's new break, breakthrough shows that Ln is uh, at least n to the minus little o of 1. So, better than any polynomial. Okay. Questions? Okay, so this is uh, the slicing problem. We're now going to take a detour to computer science to uh, vote to algorithms in high dimensional convex bodies, and this will motivate another problem, which is the KLS conjecture, which is and is also related to this problem. So now detour into CS. Well, then I have a quick question. Yeah. Can you maybe give some intuition why this is such a hard problem? I mean, it was verified for so many different bodies, so what makes it so hard? I mean, it's... Um, yeah, I, do, I don't know how to answer this question, you know? I think many people look at this and kind of say, how hard can it be? Uh, I guess my, my best, my, you know, okay, the only intuition I can give you is the fact that volumes in I dimension are very, very, like, not stable to small perturbations. So. You can show a lot of things about the geometry of convex bodies, like, you know, it's, it's bounded between two bores of different radii, like you have all those Voretsky theorem that says that most sections look like a bore in the sense that they can bound, be bounded between two bores whose radii are very close to each other. But none of these things say anything about the volume. The volume is just so sensitive to small perturbations because, you know, multiplying a body by a, a convex body by dilating it by alpha means multiplying the volume by alpha to the n. So all of these things that involve volume are like much, much more delicate. You know, if I take a convex body of uh, volume one and I just inflate it by a little bit, you know, by one plus one over root n, I multiply it. Then it's really easy to find a good section because, you know, I multiplied the volume of, of everything by like e to the root n. No, but then this scales both the volume and the volume of the section. Yeah, right? yeah, of course. Of this is meaningless, but the, the point is that like you can't really use it's very hard to extract. So convexity is a geometric property of the body. So if you want to extract convexity, you want to, you know, it implies some geometric facts about like the convex body. But volume is like much more analytic than geometric. I don't know. I mean, this philosophy may just be misleading. But, but but, you know, the that's... volume is, is then like, it takes the body and you, you sort of not, in, not by late, but like add a small ball to it or something like that, or make some small, make it smoother also, in some way. So, right, if you add a small, I mean, it depends how small, but 
like uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. You, you need to add a ball of like one over n radius to a to a body of one over root n to a body of volume one in order to you know not change the volume too much. So yeah, I don't know. I but but I mean it's a really good question. I guess I just you know don't have a good answer. Yeah. Can you say how how bad it it is broken if you if you don't take convex uh, sets? So you know if you don't yeah uh, if you don't take convex sets you basically cannot do anything. So just think about you can easily cook up like many little islands of volume one such that no matter how you cut them you just don't see anything. Um, but like, okay, the question we're going to get to KLS is, it's much easier to see why it's bro immediately broken if you don't have convexity. Here, I agree, the role of convexity is, I mean, it's, it's not immediate, maybe. Under the um, okay. Is my handwriting big enough, Javi? Anyone? Perfect, perfect. Yeah? Go on. Good, good. OK, so detour to volume computation. So here is a, a computational task given a convex body K in Rm. Suppose that you have access, you have membership access to K. What does it mean membership access? Suppose that uh, you have an oracle, a black box, that answers yes or no to questions of the form, is x in k? OK, so you can give it an x, and it tells you if it's in k or not. Very easy to implement this, for example, if k is a polytope defined by its facets. And the goal is to estimate the volume of k. So, and then you probably need, I don't know, some, some handle you want to, buy. okay, you'll tell. Right. You, you need some assumption because, you know, if K is Rn, then you don't even know what scale to check. So the reasonable assumption that we're going to, people usually uh, make, is that K is in between some little r times the Euclidean ball and some big r times the Euclidean ball, where big r over little r is some poly n, n to the 100. OK, then you, you know what, at least where to check, more or less. So this is the picture. You have a small ball and a big ball. And you have a convex body somewhere in between. Try to calculate the volume. Estimate the volume. So 
the first works on this were basically uh, observing that if the algorithm is deterministic, you really cannot do much. Okay, may maybe let me trace back just a little bit. Suppose that you are not in high dimension, but in low dimension. Suppose like I'm in dimension two, and, and I know that my convex body is like, I said here between two balls, but between two uh, cubes is more or less the same assumption, doesn't matter to, so much. So let me change it because it's gonna be a bit more convenient. I have some convex body which is sandwiched between two squares in dimension two, and I want to estimate its volume. What can I do? How can I do it? Sample random. Yeah, Monte Carlo integration, right? I can just sample, I can pretty easily sample points in the big square, and some of them are going to fall inside K. I'm gonna count how many. This will be my estimator. Done. Okay? But what happens in high dimensions? The point is in high dimensions, none of the points are going to fall inside my convex body unless the ratio between the radii of these two cubes or these two balls is like extremely close to one. Simply because, you know, I can, okay, uh, I guess if you've seen high dimensions a little bit, this is not very hard to believe. The, the point is that the convex hull, so even if all of the points, even, even if the membership oracle said yes on all my questions, so I asked about this and this and this and this and this point, and I got yes, 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 what I have is still in between the convex hull of those points and the whole square. Now the point is that if I don't ask about a ridiculously large, huge number of points, then the convex hull is going to have a very, very small volume. So there were several works but, uh, around this, but I guess the, the one that really nailed the right asymptotics is by Barani and Feleby. who basically show that, let's call it V of N and M, which is the maximal volume that I, I get by taking uh, M points in dimension N. This is bounded by, doesn't matter so much, this expression. So, so this is for M points in 0, 1 to the N. So if I have N points in a cube of volume 1, the volume of the convex hull, unless I have, you know, exponentially many, is going to be tiny uh, relative to the volume of the whole cube. So, yeah, so the first uh, result of this type was Alakash, and Barani and Kuredi improved the Alakash result. I see. Okay, thank you. So, let me add uh, Alakash here. Okay, thanks. Uh, okay, so the point is, you know, if, if the algorithm is deterministic that an adversary can just, you know, take the convex out of whatever points you ask about and, you know, you can't do much. And now we're going to the really great and very influential idea by dear and Canaan, uh, I guess, 92, who say the following thing. So, you know, that, that was 
So a deterministic algorithm definitely cannot do much. But even if you try to do Monte Carlo sampling, this estimate basically shows that you know, none of the points are going to fall in, inside. So it's really Monte Carlo integration for sparsely supported functions. Okay, maybe this is also why this problem is, has been interesting outside of the convex body community, because you know, you can do Monte Carlo integration, but if, you're, if your function is like very sparse on the domain, then you, know, you, you, you can't really do anything. So the question is, does something like convexity help us? And their idea is the following. So we're going to take an increasing sequence of radii. So remember this assumption. And let me, OK. Doesn't matter if it's balls of cube or cubes. Let's do balls. Doesn't matter. OK, I'm going to take r1, which is uh, this smaller r. And I'm going to take an increasing sequence of r's. up to R capital N, which is this big R. So I have like the picture is this, I have my convex body, I have some ball which is definitely inside it, and I look at an increasing sequence of balls, which ends up with some ball which, you know, contains my convex body. Do the people on Zoom see the different colors, or should I bother to use colors? We, we don't see it. You don't see it. Maybe like yellow, right? Yeah, maybe yellow. <laughs> Whatever. Oh. And then what we can do is we can just write that the volume of K is equal to the volume of K intersected with the largest ball. Maybe let's let's write also pi is the Euclidean ball times ri. So the volume of k is the volume of k intersected with the largest ball. But now let's divide by the volume of k intersected with b n minus one and multiply also by this volume. going and I get this telescopic product where each term looks like volume this ratio between two volumes Blah, 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 and in the end, I have to multiply by the volume of just uh, B1. Right? I mean, I didn't do anything. I just divided and multiplied by all of these things. But now the point is the following. If those R's are sufficiently close to each other, suppose that we require that Ri is, say, Ri minus 1 times 1 plus 1 over n. Uh, that's it. Like, I, I only increase by factor 1 plus 1 over n between consecutive radii. Then the ratio of volumes of consecutive balls is actually still of constant order. And it's not hard to see that also these ratios will be of constant order, OK? So now all these ratios are tractable in our Monte Carlo tractable, in the sense that if we're able to sample a point from this, and and, or from this, actually, and look at the probability that the point falls inside this, then you know, it makes sense to do like Monte Carlo estimation. 
Okay, so what we need to do... Uh, yeah. Can I say something? So yeah. you, you already uh, made some conceptual leap, uh, maybe inadvertently or maybe not, uh, I think, uh, stressed enough. You are trying to compute something or estimate something which is a volume, and now you mentioned that if you can sample, then you can do something. Now the of connection course. between sampling and approximate counting is a you know, sort of fundamental idea that preceded this, right? And uh, between, you know, I mean, of course they are related, but uh, it's not obvious that, uh, for example, right. for sampling you will not be able to do anything with the deterministic algorithm, whereas for computing you might. So that's one difference. Sampling, by definition, it's uh, so. The, yeah. the the question of uniformly or almost uniformly sampling from a convex body in this case, or from any set of objects, is a separate question. And the connection between them, the fact that they are essentially equivalent, is a result of, uh, in a very general context, is a result of Jerome Vazirani and Vazirani. Uh, sorry, Jerome uh, Valiant and Vazirani from '86, roughly. And uh, another point which happened in several previous uh, 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 algorithms for sampling or for approximate counting was this idea which might be called downward self-reduction, uh, this sequence of R's. Uh, the main thing here in this geometric setting, uh, unlike in combinatorial setting, is that you don't have coordinates to fix one at a time, or uh, this was more natural in that setting. But this idea of uh, you know, downward self-reduction is also uh, existed and uh, is also in this connection between uh, approximate counting and uh, uniform or almost uniform sampling. Right. Um, and, and, yeah. Ah, yeah. Sorry. That's, uh, that's good. No, no. It's uh, I really thought. Yeah. And, and, <laughs> you, and you also, try, like, and, and, idea, I guess right? in more recent works, uh, that have to do with calculating partition functions of, you know, easing models and such, you still see a lot of manifestations of related ideas that what you really do is sampling and you use that to calculate partition functions. So yeah, there's, thanks Avi, I guess there's, this is a very nice manifestation of an idea that, of a meta idea that existed before and yeah, I would say that the most, uh, maybe the most influential uh, result of this type was the uh, counting, approximately counting perfect matchings in dense graphs by uh, Jerome and Sinclair from the late 80s, where it's also used. And uh, yeah, but it's a combinatorial right. setting and it's, uh, yeah, anyway, it's different. Yeah. So, yeah, this is maybe the, you know, most classical manifestation in a geometric rather than combinatorial setting. Yeah. But, okay, as you, so I guess once we see this, we can all kind of agree, at least on an intuitive le level, that in order to solve our goal of uh, volume computation, we, have, we really need to solve this uh, other goal, so, uh, we need to be able to sample a point uh, from the uniform measure. So here it's going to be K intersected with B whatever, but you know, let's just, let's just try to solve the problem of taking some convex body T and sampling from it. Okay, so at least I, I, I also maybe let me say that, you know, this problem to me is more canonical than the original problem, but historically this is what motivated this. So this was, uh, this is what motivated the work of uh, KLS and, you know, the many works that followed. Uh, and yes, by now, you know, people in machine learning are very interested in being able to, to sample points from convex bodies, lock on K functions, whatever. Good. Um, any questions?
Yeah, so there was a paper of Applegate and Canaan that was a third paper. Sorry, sorry, I, I couldn't hear you because of the yeah. words. So there was a paper of Applegate and Canaan which said that sampling and integrating nice functions and volume estimate is basically the same. So that's Applegate and Canaan. I see. So, so, so the there's... first paper was the Dyer tree Canaan, then the second one was a uh, uh, Lovas Shimonovich, and then came Applegate and Canaan was the third paper, which definitely said that nice, almost convex functions that I don't make it precise can be integrated that's equivalent over a convex area. I see, so there, I see, so I didn't know it. So there is also an implication in the other direction. Yeah. Ah, I guess I see why. Okay, if you can integrate, you can also sample, of course. Um, yeah, and this is in the, again, in the combinatorial setting, uh, this variant, um, Jerome Vazirani, the connection is two ways. Yeah, I mean, I guess in the combinatorial setting, it's even easier to see it because then you can, you can just sample coordinate by coordinate and you just have to integrate to understand. Yeah, sure. Yeah. So you can, you can also do this here. Um, yeah, thanks for the comment. Unfortunately, I don't see the names of, I, I don't always see who's speaking, so. Uh, I am Miklos Shimonovich. Ah, hi, Miklos. Hi. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I, I sometimes recognize the voice. Avi's voice is very distinctive, I guess, but not, not everyone's voice. Um, okay. Uh, so we're interested in sampling and I guess, you know, the uh, computer science community will be very familiar with, you know, this um, relation between expansion and spectral gap. Well, how you sample, well, the only way to sample is really with Markov chains, right? Okay, so on a very informal level, if we want to sample, we probably want to use a Markov chain and we want to say that it mixes kind of quickly, how do we do that? We, uh, well, this is implied by having a good spectral gap for the uh, kernel of the Markov chain. And how do we establish that there is spectral gap? So one very good way to do it is to use the so-called Chigger Okay, so I guess just the, the you know, result of Chigger that holds in many, many settings that tells you that if you have expansion, you have set spectral gap. Let me just comment that in this setting of uh, convex bodies, I didn't really say what, you know, with respect still to which Laplacian, but let me just write that here, we also have the reverse implication, and this is due to uh, Poser, and uh, let's do. And uh, yeah, I guess this relation is just uh, for, I mean, depends what we call mixing time, but uh, I, I didn't say it what I mean by mixing time. So, but this, this is uh, like, there is not much to do here. Okay, so I guess all of you know this. Uh, can you explain why, why do you need the Markov chain? Is this like a way of sampling, instead of sampling from the big box and, and using the Oracle, this, this is our way of so, sampling? So, okay, so, so let me, okay. So now, now we have, what, what, what's the problem we have now? 
I have some convex body. I have, I have a membership oracle for it. I want to sample a point, okay? Like, what ways are there to sample a point? Again, I can take some, uh, you know, cube that encompasses the body, sample a uniform point in the cube. If it doesn't fall inside, I reject it. If it falls inside, I accept it. Boom, I have a random point. This is not good. Why? Because none of the points are going to fall inside. So the only other thing I know how to do is to find, to start from some fixed point inside and to find some Markov chain that, you know, whose stationary distribution is just the uniform one and show that it mixes. Okay? So that's, so that's the analog of just randomly work on your... Uh, yeah, yeah. That, that's or... just, yeah, that's just, there are several types of random walks, but maybe the, uh, the simplest one is the so-called ball walk. So I think this one was first considered by, uh, in the KLS paper of uh, 95. This dear Fritz and Kanan also had some other mark of chain where they basically had a grid and they did some kind of discrete random walk, but maybe a more natural thing is to do the so-called ball walk where you fix some radius, and what you do is, suppose I'm at some point here, I take a uniform point in a ball of radius r around whatever point I'm at, if it's inside the body, I accept and move to this new point, if it's outside, I just do it again. Uh, Ronald, can I say something? Sure, always. So, <laughs> uh, so in this connection between expansion, spectral gap, and mixture time, which is in fact uh, clearly familiar to many computer scientists and uh, combinatorics and statistical physicists, so on. In many settings that are typically studied, uh, one talks about a constant spectral gap, which is not the case here. One is one normally the expanders are constant spectral gap, and these are graphs that are normally I don't know size and here n uh, just says that the Markov chain will actually be exponential in this parameter n, so that's a very different game. I mean, that's a game in all statistical physics and enumeration application. That one, uh, so we are like we, we would like to do something in polynomial time in n, and for that it is sufficient to have a spectral gap that is just is not a constant. We don't need a constant. Polynomial in n is sufficient. So it's a different game. That's a change of parameter. Yeah, so, right, I mean, even the fact that it's not exponential but polynomial is not completely trivial to show, even though this is, yeah, I guess this is not very hard. But yeah, a priori, the mixing time of these things could be exponential, as Avi said, and it was already dear Fritz and Kanan showed that it's polynomial, and then the game is to show, you know, polynomial with what exponent, right? And yeah, it's never going to be a constant number of steps. So, okay, so what's the ball walk? Fix r uh, bigger than zero, and then our random walk at time t plus one is going to be just uniform on the ball centered at the random walk at time t with radius r but not exactly up to rejection, so reject, resample. If x t plus one happens to fall outside of, uh, of k, okay? So this is a uh, the simplest probably, or one of the simplest Markov chains you can think of, and it turns out, and this, I guess, in the context of this random walk, it was shown in the KLS paper, 
that if you have spectral gap with respect to the usual Laplacian, so you take the Neumann Laplacian for the body in Rm, I'll tell you what it is uh, soon, then it also implies uh, mixing times for this, uh, for the boardwalk. Okay, so I mean, what, what this does is, you know, it kind of imitates what a reflecting Brownian motion is doing, but of course, you pay something for this, the discretization, you pay something for the fact that you can fall outside, blah, blah, blah. So there's, you know, there's still work to do, but essentially, What's the discretization here? Um, discretization, I mean, you know, yeah, R. R is the, I, I mean R when I say this discretization. And, uh, but the, the point is that the implication from here to here, which is what you pay for the discretization, is, is very well understood. The implication from here to here is just trigger, and what remains really in order to understand how how efficient you can make, you can sample points how efficiently is to understand expansion. Yeah. yeah okay. Yeah. Just to be clear, uh, how do we use this to calculate the volume of the body, or we or we move to the next question? Ah, so so or like now, if if we know that this mixes. Then we can sample uniform points, and then we can sample for every such ratio. I can sample a uniform point inside oh. this oh. guy. Check the probability that it's inside this guy. I do it enough times so that I have a good estimate of this ratio. I do it for all ratios. There are not so many like this. It still like, you know, behaves like log of something because like there is multiplication here. That's it. Like and, and the definition of mixing time sort of just into that context is so you want to hit every like compact set with the uh, like, yeah the so 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 good question. How do we define mixing time? Uh, you can do it just in total variation in this context. Just the total variation of the distribution of xt to the actual uniform measure. This is going to work. So you, you can also ask about hitting times and all sorts of other stuff, but you do get I mean, this implication does give you something in terms of total variation. So well, in any norm you want, really. Yeah, in any norm you want, really. There's, there's still a game of, you know, yeah. The, I mean, if, if you just want Wasserstein, maybe you can save a little bit take a slightly bigger R when you're close to the middle. I mean, it's not like there, there is still some work to, to do if you want to improve things, but if you just want to, if you just want to get a polynomial estimate, you pretty, like, it's pretty standard to get now, given, you know, the ideas in KLS, to get a total variation estimate. So total variation is is the, your way of measuring how far xt uh, is from uh, being random, from yeah. being uniform on the... From being uniform. And uh, that's depend on t, and then you're saying that the mixing time would be... The mixing time is would, like, the epsilon the, mixing time is how large t should be to be epsilon close in total variation to the uniform. Yeah. Um, and I mean, there is a little, okay, yeah, okay. There is usually this implication needs something called a warm start. I'm not going to get into this. It's like, it's kind of like another, but, but like everything I said is true. If you want to really get the best, the best implication from here to here, you need something called a warm start. You want the first point. Not to be a fixed point, but some decent distribution on your uh, that you're starting with. But this, uh, yeah.
this doesn't matter so much. Let's put it aside. Uh, okay, so what do we mean by expansion? Excuse me, is ball walk just a specific type of metropolitan casings algorithm? Yeah, yes, it's you can, you know, frame it as a metropolis Hastings algorithm. Usually, you know, in metropolis Hastings, it's not a uniform measure on something, but yeah, it's a special case. Sure. You could do a Gaussian jump with metropolis Hastings, like you can hook up many uh, Markov chains. This is just the simplest ones. Okay, so, you know, uh, this is, uh, I'm, I assume I'm talking to a CS community, even though I don't even see black squares. I just, you know, see three people. But for CS community, expansion is most well understood on graphs. So what's expansion on graphs? Let's draw a graph and call it k, okay? Incidentally, k is also used to denote convex bodies. And what's an expansion on the on a graph k? Well, it basically amounts to taking a subset of the set of vertices, let's call it t, and say that this subset has, you know, proportional measure, so, you know, it's not very small, but also not very large, and the expansion is just, you know, the number of edges going here, where, when I basically take the infimum over t. Well, this exact picture is also valid in the convex uh, case, right? So, I can also consider a convex set k, take all subsets t, whose measure is, you know, roughly one half of the measure of k, or at least not close to zero or one, and ask what is the minimal surface area of this. And well, in our end, surface area is a pretty obvious notion. So let me do just, uh, I guess, two definitions. So for a convex body K, uh, denote by mu K, just the uniform measure, and for a measure mu, for any measure mu, Set T, what's the surface area, what's the boundary measure of T with respect to mu? So I'm going to denote by mu of the boundary of T to be the following thing. It's going to be the limit as epsilon goes to zero. Maybe let's say here lim soup, because I don't know that it converges of uh, just the measure mu taken on t epsilon minus t, where t epsilon is just the epsilon extension. It's called the x such that the distance between x and t is at most epsilon. So, here is the picture. Suppose mu is just the uniform measure of, of, on k, and I want the boundary measure. So what is mu sub k of t? Well, take some small epsilon. I want to take uh, of, of the boundary of t or of t? an x of the boundary, thanks, of t. I want to to extend t 
So T, you know, is a subset of the, you know, it can go here as well. It doesn't, I didn't say that it's inside K. I'm going to extend T by this strip whose width is epsilon. And I'm going to measure this thing with respect to mu sub k and take epsilon to zero. Divide by epsilon, take the epsilon to zero. If t is uh, nice, yeah, then this is really like epsilon, right? what what? In the definition, you forgot to divide by epsilon, right? I did forget to divide epsilon. by epsilon. Epsilon to, to the power of the dimension or something like no, that? No, just epsilon. Just epsilon? It's a one-dimensional oh, no, expansion. Okay. Yeah. No matter what dimension. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. thanks. Uh, so, you know, when I take the limit, it's just, you know, it's, it's, it's really just this surface area. It's the surface area of T, which is inside K. Okay? So this is uh, the boundary measure. And now that we have a boundary measure, we can define, uh, let's make the following definition. So the Cheeger constant of a bo convex body K doesn't, there is no convexity here, by the way, in any of these definitions right now, is just going to be defined as the infimum over all T of the boundary measure of t with respect to k over mu k t 1 minus mu k t. So this denominator is just making sure that t is not too small or too large with respect to k. But really, there is a There is a result due to uh, Sternberg and Zumbrun. Uh, and I guess a related extension by Immanuel Milman also, which shows that if you don't like the den denominator, well, forget about the denominator. The worst case is going to always be attained when the volume of T with respect to K is one half. So this is just equivalent to taking up to constants. This is equivalent, but just take this, what I write here as the definition. Infimum over all T Rn such that the mu K of T is exactly one half of mu sub k of the boundary. So really what, the, what, what this definition says is I have a convex body k and I want to cut it, cut its volume into two parts such that each, each part is exactly one half of the volume of k and I want to minimize The surface area of the yellow thing. You want the most. Well, this, uh, well, man, this cannot be a true in full generality. I mean, it's not true in graphs, for example. So it's. Uh, ah, sorry. This is this is with convexity. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, this, yeah exactly. The, the, this thing uses convexity. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Of course. Now, um, like, or it's not true in graphs, and if it's not convex, I can take something like this with, like, take some bottleneck here. And then if it's exactly one half, it can be like much smaller than, if, if it's not one half, I can't, you know, use this bottleneck. So convexity is crucial for, for this. Yeah, good okay, point. Like four times? Okay. Yeah, so this, this, just, this is just up to some oh, yeah. constant. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, okay, so if you want, take this definition. I don't know if on camera you can see up to the bottom here. This is a very important definition, so it's important yeah, we can see. that everyone sees it. Okay, good. So this is, this is uh, psi sub k. Uh, good. And so this is the 
this is the, the trigger constant for, uh, for a convex body? Yes, this is the trigger constant for a convex body. And we want and, to, uh, to maybe I should say we call it uh, conductance, or so that's a name in the computer science literature. That's this ratio yeah. five sub k, the conductance of the Markov chain. Yeah, computer scientists. I guess because computers have lots of conductors in them. Like that's absolutely the reason. Yeah, that's the only reason. Conductors. <laughs> um, and, okay, so so this 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 is what we are going to mean when we say expansion, and it's pretty standard to show that if this is not too small, then you have those implications, and then the ball walk or other Markov chains have good mixing times. Okay. Yeah, well, then maybe again, it's not too small means one over a polynomial, and this up to polynomial factors will translate to one over polynomial spectral gap, and into a polynomial time, uh mixing uh, mixing time and right. eventually to one plus one of a polynomial approximation of the volume yes so if you just want a polynomial time algorithm as you said it's enough to get like one over poly n here and then you know you have everything and you can have pretty good estimates of the volume uh, well, I don't know if you want to take a break or not. It's up to you. I, they, we let the speakers decide. I see. They, uh, what's what's usually done? Like what's uh, the norm? It, maybe more often than not, people take like a five minute break if they. Okay, it, the, it's a good point to take a five minute break. So, right. so let's, let's do take it. a five minute break. Okay. Like the intersection of the half space? That's going to be the conjecture. Yeah. What's a good, what's it's a good lecture. It's all the that, questions. That the infimum is yeah. attained on half spaces. Yeah, we that, added the semester with the best songs. So, what fraction of the applications completely break down if you don't prove KLS with constants? So the, the whole game is to, to know it's polynomial time, but you want to know the exponents. Oh, right, for the but algorithmic application. The algorithmic applications is just, yeah, the number of steps directly depends on. Right, so you get something from the end to the little of 180. I, I guess I'm curious, like, are there any math applications that just don't work with even the end to the, end to the little of 1? You don't get anything more interesting? Any math applications that like are, are there any applications of KLS that uh, that crucially rely on it being constant and you don't get anything from those applications? Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. Good, good question. Um, not that I know actually. Ah. So basically, everything that depends on this improves ah, when nice. you get yeah everything I can think of. Excellent. Okay. <clears throat> I think uh, our time is up. So, Ronan, are you there? I am here. Yeah, so everybody else must be there then. So, please proceed. <laughs> I'm, I'm not sure I understood the logics, but everyone else is indeed <laughs> here, so... Uh, it's a definition, uh, Ronan. <laughs> uh, okay, so this, this is what we ended up with, with this isoperimetric problem. On convex bodies, we have a convex body K. We want to find the subset T, which is exactly half the volume. And what we're measuring is the red thing over here, right? Not all the boundary of T, just the boundary of T, which is inside K. Okay? So just this red thing. And we want lower bounds on this. This is the notion of expansion. Now, uh, we're going to be pretty naive if we try to get lower bounds for every convex body K, or even there, there definitely needs to be some normalization we need to do. Of course, it's, if it's just a tiny ball, then, you know, everything is tiny. But also, if we assume, for example, that the volume of K is equal to 1, that's not a good enough normalization. Why? So, 
could be that the volume is equal to one, but the body K is like very long and narrow. And then, you know, I can cut it here with this, you know, tiny cut. So we need to make sure that, you know, it's somehow big in all directions. And for this, Cynthia asked me the exact right question, uh, which is maybe we expect that the, uh, those cuts, those worst cuts will be just flat cuts. So what we're going to define in order to normalize things correctly is the following. So we add psi sub k, but now let's define psi sub k with a lin here, denoted linear, to be just the infimum. And here, instead of, of taking all subsets t, I'm only going to, going to consider half spaces. So h is a half space with whose measure with respect to k is one half. And No, you're missing an equality sign. Thanks. Okay, so here we consider all cuts. Here we only consider flat cuts. And what makes sense is to say, is to maybe require that my convex body is normalized, maybe, you know, up to a linear transformation that I make sure that this is not too small, and then perhaps this will also be not too small, okay? And this definition is, you know, maybe it's kind of hard to check that all cuts, or even just, just you know, I give you a convex body, make sure that this is not too small. Maybe this, if, this sounds like a, is not so easy to do, but here is a fact which is not hard, and I think uh, next week we'll more or less see it. Uh, so if if I normalize my convex body so that the covariance matrix of mu sub k is the identity. I can always do it by applying a linear transformation to my convex body. What do you mean by the covariance matrix? Take a unit, this is a measure. Yeah. The, just the covariance matrix of a measure in Rn, so it's just defined as cov. Um, you know, if I have a random vector x, the ij entry is just the expectation of x i x j. Minus their uh, middle. Uh, their, uh, minus. Yeah, but, but, yeah. but how do you. So, exit samples from the body. Yeah, exactly. So, so what? Th this is when x is sampled from. Okay. Covariance matrix of the measure mu is, is this when x is sampled from mu. Okay, so, okay, so I, I just kind of normalize it to be... Uh, with respect to the coordinates. Yes. Okay. But it doesn't matter which... I mean, if I require this, it doesn't matter which coordinates. Yeah. Use it. Uh, so if the, uh, it's normalized like this, and this is called isotropic, so if it's uh, an isotropic position, then... The linear Cheever constant is at least con constant, whatever. I think one over e works. E is, you know, the natural exponent. Okay, this is uh, very classical. It's it just follows basically from Brunkowski and quality. Um, let me not do it now because I think 
I don't but want to make this you, detour right now. But. Maybe yeah. it's good to make the point that uh, you are free to make uh, these linear transformations since they change the volume in a predictable amount. So you might as well work with it. A sure. body right. if, if, if we're going back to the volume computation problem, of course we can do linear transformations as we wish and then in the end divide by the determinant. Right. Okay. Um, so really what the notion that we really care about is um, this would be maybe our most central definition let's define psi n to be the infimum over all convex sets of this ratio between psi k and psi lin of k. Ronan, so, sorry, can I ask you a quick question? Sure. So this isotropic position, uh, how is it related to the uh, John's ellipsoid being a ball, is it uh, like, are they similar or it's, un it's unclear? It's, uh, it... it's, it's unclear. It's, it's a very good question. There is many ways to take, okay, I, I actually, this one is, is clear now, but it's really not obvious. So, so there are many ways to take a convex body and say that it's in good position. Maybe we want to take the largest ellipsoid you can fit in to the convex body, which is John's ellipsoid, and say that this is a ball. Maybe we want to take the smallest encapsulating ellipsoid and say that that one is a ball. And, and there are several positions which we might have wanted to compare to this isotropic position. So, for John's position, I think this is now well understood, but really the, the, they can be very, very different. Some directions can be, can have ratio root n between them. Okay, and we may not have this uh, property for psilin, but for them. Yes. Okay, thank you. I mean, just, just you know, take a ball, cut it with a slab in one direction, then this is really not in John's position, but it's almost in isotropic position. This shows you that those two things are, can be very unrelated. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so we finally get to the central conjecture, uh, the KLS conjecture. 95, so they ask the question, is it true that there exists a universal constant such that this is bounded from below. In other words, is it true that the most efficient way to cu cut a convex body into two halves of equal mass is via a hyperplane cut up to a constant? So what do we know about the KLS conjecture so far? Very brief history, there will be more history as I uh, continue the talk, but what uh, KLS showed in their original paper is the bound psi n is at least n to the minus one half. So this, this is his brief history. Uh, 
Um, and then I guess the next result is a combination of a result by Botkov and the result by Klartag. So it's not one paper, but it's Botkov plus Klartag. Seems like a small improvement, but still very significant breakthrough in terms of the ideas that need to be used. Uh, this is uh, at least n to the minus one half plus epsilon, where epsilon is like 0 0.001 or whatever. And then uh, there were several improvements, maybe uh, one that needs, like, let me just mention here that there was Klartag's result was improved by Gedon and Milman to get like uh, n to the minus, what was it? Uh, I think 5 over 12, but don't, uh, hold on, yeah, I think 5 over 12. And then there was a result of myself whose point wasn't to improve this, but as a corollary also got like uh, n to the minus one third and leave and pala. I guess okay, maybe this is this is like O seven. This is like uh, 10, this is uh, 2013, Riesenthal uh, 16 gave n to the minus 1 over 4. Um, and now Chen got n to the minus little o of 1 and one of the reasons that this is exciting is that there is a result uh, together with Clartag 2011 which Remember the slicing problem by Bourguin, where we wanted a lower bound on LN. Is, is LN related to psi in our Exactly. Way? So LN, together with Clarta, we showed that LN is at least uh, psi N. That's it. Any bound you have on psi N gives you a bound on LN, which is a... Uh, why at this point where you had the n to the minus 1 over 4 which matched the best bound for ln, for many people it kind of seemed like maybe this is the end of the way, maybe this is what's true because you really get from here to like using like kind of different techniques, you get another proof or at, at that point there were already several kind of independent proofs of n to the minus 1 over 4 for a slicing problem. Um, so, yeah, maybe, or let me mention here another, so, so this result basically tells you if you have a bound for KLS for all possible convex bodies, like if you have a Chigar bound for all possible convex bodies, then you have this bound for all possible convex bodies. But it doesn't work for one particular convex body. It's not like point wise. Okay. Tell you uh, something about an idea in this. Uh, I mean, the connection is certainly not obvious to me. So, something about the proof of this? I'm going to get to it. So, okay. the, the methods I'm going to tell you give an alternative proof of this, which I may have enough time to do next week. I may and I may not. 
you, you can always uh, volunteer to give uh, two more hours for the following week, but I will not ask you now. Let, let's let's talk. No, I'm. I mean, I'm. Uh, why not? But let's talk about it later. Um, you should ask everyone else, not me. Okay, so um, let me just mention that there is a, a result by Keith Ball and. Uyen, Van Uyen, that showed basically the same thing, but uh, 12, but only point-wise, but not this kind of dependence. They showed that L sub K is at least X to the minus one over the Chigger constant. So if you know that this is constant, it gives you that this is constant. But if you know that this is like log n, it gives you nothing. So there are two implications why if the KLS conjecture is true, then also slicing is true, but only this one gives you like an improvement for slicing given chance uh, recent result. Uh, okay, so this I, I did uh, skip a whole bunch of works in the middle which and many works that establish this for particular cases of convex bodies, but um, I think you know those are maybe the the central. Um, is the I apologize if I overlooked someone's result. Is the uh, like is there any conjectured extremal example for cyan, and is that the same as for Ellen? Ah, uh, yeah, very good question. Um, is, is the worst convex body for Psion the same for Ellen? I don't think anyone has a conjecture or a guess or... Somehow, you know, in convex, somehow the natural guess for the worst thing is always a simplex. Uh, just because, I don't know, that, that's the only thing where we have some examples for which this is the worst thing. But... You have either a ball or a simplex. Or if it's symmetric, you have the cube or the L1 ball. These are the only ones who we can say are extremal with respect to some essentially properties. OK. Uh, Ronan, Ron, sorry, but is it clear that this is smaller than 1? Like, is there an example where a linear is not the worst? Like, some simple example for, for a simplex? Or... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just, just I mean. Take a ball and, like, in two dimensions, take a circle and perturb it a little bit. It will not be like, uh, I mean, in, in two dimensions, you can really know that it's like a circular arc. And this circular arc doesn't have to be straight. Okay. So, yeah, it's, it's not hard to hook up examples. This, you know, when you perturb a convex body, you, you also perturb the minimal surface with it, so, yeah. Uh, okay. This is taking, I'm going a bit slower than I planned, but what, what I still want to do today is, um, okay, one last thing, sorry. Let me go back here, because I, I do, I do want to mention, one thing about this result that uh, we're going to talk about it later as well. What this result really does is not, like the point is not to get a lower, a new lower bound for this. What this result does is it considers, so we had psi n, the Chigger constant, we had psi n lin, and what it does is considered psi n quad, where you look at, so not linear, but quadratic, where you take the infimum, where for all t, where, when, when t is not a half space, but an ellipsoid. And So you know you can take a convex body. You can cut it with any anything you want. You can cut it with linear things, 
And you can try to cut it with ellipsoids. And what this result really shows is that, well, if you, if you consider all ellipsoids, then up to like root log n, you, you actually do have that. So uh, you have that this is uh, at least So up to root log n, if, it's, it's, if you want to find the best cut, it's enough to consider just you know, level sets of quadratic functions rather than linear functions, as the conjecture says. Uh, this is, OK, we'll get back to it. want to do in the time I have left is give you a sketch of I want to give you a sketch of how to prove this bound and for this I want to tell you about the concept of localization So this is, I mean, in a slightly different context, I guess. There's a paper by Grom and Milman that did this. And then there's, uh, in this context, and like using slightly different ideas, was used by Lovas and Shimonovitz. Which Milman is that? This is uh, Vitaly Milman, 80 something, I think 81. And uh, then also was kind of further developed by in the KLS paper. So how to try to prove a, a bound for the Cheeger constant uh, for a convex body? So remember the fact that I already erased, which basically said that we can assume that the covariance matrix of mu sub k is the identity. And then we, we, we know essentially what is psi lin of k. So we, we, we assume this, and then we just want to lower bound the Cheeger constant. This is the normalization we're going to get, to have. And step zero, which I'm not going to uh, explain how to do, but this is standard and really not too hard, is uh, essentially, we may assume that the diameter of k is at most some constant, let's say 10 times root n. So this assumption says that the covariance matrix is the identity, if the, if the measure is also centered, if the expectation is zero, it means that the expected distance square of a random point from the origin is root n. So I have the convex body k, this is the origin, most like the, the typical point is a distance root n from the origin. And what this says is, so, so by Markov's inequality, if you take, by Markov's inequality, most points are a distance at most 10 root n. So outside a ball of radius 10 root n, we don't have lots of mass. And step zero is to say, without losing much, 
we can really assume that the whole thing is inside ten rudder. Okay, this is, I guess, not too hard to believe. It's ten, it's it's really not too hard to do. But uh, I mean, ten is arbitrary. Right? Ten is like it needs to be more than like one, definitely. But yeah, but yeah. Like some... yeah, yeah. It's just, I mean, it's not arbitrary. We have ten fingers. We use the decimal system. It's an important number. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, so now, what, what, what do we do? So what do we want to prove? So we're, we're going to forget about this isotropicity assumption, and really what we want to prove is that this is at least 1 over the diameter of K. So given a convex body whose diameter is not too large, we want to show that it has good isoperimetry. that such a bound is true for uh, transitive graphs. You have a lower bound on expansion, which is one of the of the diameter. I'm sure it's unrelated, but it's... Uh... Yeah, um, nice. But yeah, I'm sure it's unrelated as well, but... Yeah. Okay, let me try to hand wave the argument and uh, hopefully you'll see the, the very nice idea in, the, in, in this technique of localization. So this is k, this is t, t is half of k, and what we're going to do is the following. We're going to cut k into two pieces such that each piece is going to, to have half the volume of K, but also in each piece, the, the proportional volume of T inside this piece is half of the volume of the piece. So what I want to do is find the cut, and this cut is going to be flat. A cut like this into two... Uh, convex bodies, K1 and K2. So this is K1 and the other one is K2. I don't want to, you know, so, so this half is going to be K1 and this half is going to be K2. And I want to find the cut such that the volume of K1 is equal to the volume of K2 but also the volume of T intersected with K1 is equal to the volume of T intersected with K2. This is what I want. So I, wa I really want to know that it'll, in this picture, it will be a quarter, a quarter, a quarter, a quarter of the whole volume. OK? How do we do that? So. In each direction that I give you, let, let, let me give you a direction theta in the sphere. And then you have a hyperplane orthogonal to theta. You can always, you know, by continuity, you can always move it to find the point where you cut k into exactly two halves, right? Now, now let's try to rotate theta. So we cut k into two halves. But we didn't cut t into two halves. But suppose that for some theta, the proportion of t here is too large. If I take the antipodal theta, the proportion of t will be too small. And again, by continuity, if I rotate theta along any two-dimensional circle, by you know the intermediate point theorem, I'll definitely find the theta such that both. This is just a topological argument such that both of these hold true. 
Does it make sense? How can you do it without rolling the k1 equal to k2? So for every direction, I'm going to put it in the place where where this already holds. Okay, okay, I see. That, for uh, any direction, I can make this condition hold, and this yes. other condition is like is after, after one dimension less. Yeah. Okay. okay. So I have this sub manifold of directions where both of these holds sub manifold in the sphere. And you're saying that it's it, it's still continuous after your yeah yeah everything here is continuous like you see if I move this if I move this everything is continuous so what did we do we we make, we found so now let's take one of them one of those sides the total surface area of T is going to be you know this plus this. So in order to, you know, so, so in order to give a lower bound for the total thing, I can just, you know, separately give a lower bound for any of them. And in the end, I'm going to sum them up. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to, so I have this one cut, and I'm just going to keep cutting. So now, now let's do the same thing for K1. So I have another cut here where I chopped K1 into two halves of equal mass, and also I chopped T inside K1 into two halves of equal mass. And I can find another cut here, etc., etc. And if I continue doing this process, what I claim is that I can make the choices so I end up with things which are arbitrarily close to being one-dimensional. So they are arbitrarily close to being like very, very small cylinders around some lines. Just because if, if my set does not look like, as long as my set does not look like, so, so maybe it looks like this. It's almost one-dimensional. Like it's a line, like, very, very slightly thickened line. Maybe T is here. T is this half. If I cut it, I cannot cut it like this. I cannot do this cut because then I totally, you know, the proportion of T, I, I messed it up completely. I need to keep cutting in this direction all the time, so maybe I'm not changing it so much. But this is only given the way you drew T. T could have gone in the same direction as uh, K. Yes, if T goes in the same direction, then I can keep cutting, but then at some point I will get like a needle going this way. Yeah. The point is, it, I may be able to keep cutting even if it looks like this. But what I want to say is the other thing is that as long as it does not look like this, as long as it's not almost one dimensional, as long as I have two, di two different directions in which the, the body, the, the, the set is large, I have this direction and also this direction where the set is large, then I can cut it and change, and one of the directions I, I can make it shrink significantly. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm, I'm not going to, you know, I mean, I mean, here, let's, let's just keep it at this level of hand-waving. I think, you know, the intuition is kind of clear that if I keep cutting, I end up with something very, very close to, like, those one, so-called one-dimensional needles. So, as a statement, you did the covariance matrix would now uh, be... Just, uh, the, uh, just rank one. The covariance yeah, one. matrix will approach, will approach like rank one. one. Yeah, good point. So, if we just keep doing that and, you know, consider some limit of this, of this procedure, what we end up is with something called the needle decomposition of the uniform measure. So needle 
decomposition lemma uh, which kind of looks like this I can always write mu k you can ki kind of consider this foliation of mu k as the integral over some abstract set of measures, let's call it mu theta dm of theta. So there exists some probability measure on an abstract space of indices such that for every index I have a probability measure. So there exists m and those mu theta, which are all probability measures, such that I can write my original measure as a decomposition, and such that all of those mu thetas, okay, and I have two things, so maybe let me write here the quantifier, so this is for all mu sub k and t. So I fix my k and t. I can find this decomposition such that, first of all, for all theta, we have that mu theta of t is one half, meaning on all the needles they kept the right proportion. And For all theta, there exist two vectors, V theta, W theta in Rn, and the convex function V from R to R, such that, let me continue here, such that mu theta has a very, very nice form. It's basically one dimensional and it's also log concave, meaning that mu theta of a set W is just, for all W, it just has the form integral between minus infinity to infinity uh, of, and here, e to the minus uh, v of t going, and the indicator that v theta plus t w theta uh, let me write bigger v theta plus t w theta is inside uh, w dt. What is v of t? Oh, the function you define. V, v, there exists some, what does this mean? There exists some needle, right? A location and a direction. And on top of this needle, I have the density, which is of the form e to the minus a convex function. So really, we have decomposed the uniform measure on K to many, many, many measures over those needles. But it's not the uniform measure of, over those needles. When we converge to this one-dimensional set, we don't converge via an actual cylinder. There is still some Jacobian going on here. But basically, convexity of the convexity of the process Make sure that this Jacobian has is is convex in the sense that I get some low concave density. I, I I see that I'm over time, but I think I need three more minutes. Yeah, yeah, just uh, yes. yeah, just finish, and then also we'll uh, we'll have questions. But I have question uh, already. Uh, this is true, I assume, not just for a convex body, but for any low concave measure on Rn. The needle decomposition lemma, is it? This is true for any log concave measure on our end. Yeah, and the proof is exactly the same. Okay. Right. Yeah, but 
yeah, the, 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 main, the, the main thing, the main important thing that you hear is that you get this convex Jacobian, and this is because as you converge to the needle, you converge via convex sets. And the Brun Minkowski inequality basically tells you that if convex sets converge to a line, then the density converges to a low concave density on this line. And yeah, I obviously I don't have time to right now to really explain this, but this is also something that I guess we'll spend a little bit of time on next week. So we need the punchline about the relation Good. to that. So, so we just need the punchline. Now that we have this decomposition, what, what can we do? We have the decomposition of the measure. So we can just say, if I go back to the picture upstairs, I have the decomposition of the measure. This boundary measure is also decomposed into you know, the integral of the boundary measures of t with respect to those mu theta. So I want to say that mu k of t is, well, it's not equal, but it's bigger or equal. I don't yeah. want to... The boundary of t of, or t itself? Boundary of t, thanks. So by this decomposition for any set I write here, maybe let me just write here, t epsilon minus t. So this yeah. epsilon strip is just equal to the integral of the same thing with respect to this measure. And now I'm ju I, we just, if we just have a lower bound for the integrand, then we're done. But what is the integrand? The integrand is really a one-dimensional thing. Every such needle is a one-dimensional needle. We have t here, which you know translates to some subset of this interval. So the boundary measure of t is just, you know, it's just it's basically just the density at the points of the boundaries. So all we need is a result saying that for one-dimensional low concave measures, large sets have large boundaries. Okay? Now comes our assumption about the diameter. The fact that the, 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 the diameter of K is small means that also the diameter of this measure on the needle is small. So all we have left to do is to consider low concave measures, one-dimensional low concave measures, whose support is rather small, and say that those have good sugar constants. And this is almost an exercise. So this is, all, all we're missing is a lemma saying that if mu is log concave on R, so now everything is, we've localized it to one dimensional, then uh, for all subsets of R, T, such that mu of T is equal to one half, we have, we have that mu of the boundary of T is at least one over the diameter of the support of mu. There obviously has to be here some normalization. So, you know, otherwise I could make mu much, much larger and then the boundaries would be smaller. But this is, the, the diameter of the bigger thing exactly gives us the bound that we need in order to, you know, say that 
the needles in this needle decomposition are going to be correctly normalized. So one thing I'm confused by is what is the boundary in one dimension? It's just, it's just that, I, so yeah, I mean, if, if, if T is just a, sum, a, a union of intervals, it's just the endpoints of the intervals, uh, you know. But, but it's, it's easier to think of the, the usual notion of boundary, which is taking epsilon inflation. Yeah, okay. You can do exactly the same thing. The density, yeah, just the, the derivative of the CDF, which is the density. And this is tight. You cannot improve anything here. No, this is completely tight. And and maybe just just to finish, why why is this? Where are we losing here? It seems like we're you know maybe we're not losing much, but really what happens is just consider Euclidean ball. And suppose that T is just a half space. Then the needle decomposition you get is just parallel needles, like this. And you know, this needle in the center here will actually have diameter root n. Because if the if the ball is isotropic, its yeah. diameter is like root n, this needle will have diameter root n. But it's not hard to see that most needles, like the vast majority, will really be here. Their length will really be one. It'll be much, much smaller than the diameter of the whole thing. So really the fact, you know, the, 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 the fact that the diameter of the, the effective diameter of the needle is just bounded by the diameter of the body is very wasteful. And in fact, if we could only show that the needle decomposition gives you something which is more or less parallel, if you have some direction such that most needles are more or less parallel to this direction, then we can prove KLS. Like, because in any direction, most needles will be kind of short because this is just the variance of, our, of the uniform measure on K in this direction. So, yeah, I'm, I'm really over time here. So maybe let's, uh, I'll take questions and then. Uh, Thanks for the speaker, first of all. Yeah. Okay. Uh, great, so questions to Ronan. Hi, Ronan, uh, this is Boris Hannon. Hey, uh, Boris. Hey, so question about the needle decomposition. Maybe you said this, but I missed it. So is it true that V is uniformly convex over all the needles? Is, in, is, it, is it true? Can you ask again? That sorry, so, so, so this is, this V you have, it, does it depend on ah, theta or not? Ah, is it uniformly convex on all yeah. the needles? Great question. If it was, then we would basically be able to prove KLS. If it was uniformly convex, with you know a convexity that does not depend on dimension, we would be done. Because if you have a uniformly convex uh, one-dimensional local cave density, then you you really don't need the diameter here in the de denominator. Yeah, Instead exactly. Instead of diameter, you can just put the modulo of convexity, and then you would be done. So any, any uniform convexity you can establish on these needles would be extremely helpful. On the other hand, if you just take this example again of the ball and a half space, it's not hard to see that, you know, those needles will actually be cylinders. So, so, so phi will be, you know, convex in a very weak way. You see what I'm saying? You would just get indicators of intervals. In yeah, this example. I, see. I see. But is it true that you expect V to be better precisely when the diameter is bigger? You know. Uh, so, so in this, you know, the, the point is, the, this example really shows you that it's not V where you should expect to get an improvement. It's, it's somehow like, or maybe yes, but it's somehow like for most needles, there, it should be like a statement saying 
something for most needles rather than for all needles, you want to say that either the support is small or V is like uniformly convex, as you say, or something of the sort. Got it. Okay, yeah, thanks for a really nice talk, Ronan. Uh, more questions, go ahead. I have, I have a question. I want a very nice talk. So I have a question. So here you see this. Shaha? Ah, Shaha. Hey, that, that, I thought um, yes. it was you. Okay. Yeah, okay. Um, so you're assuming T to be an arbitrary set. What if you instead assume T to be convex or some other type of nice set? Would this help right. right? Very good question. If T is assumed to be convex, can you say anything more than you could have? Nothing is known. So very good question. If T is convex, can you do something that you couldn't do? Uh, I, I'm pretty sure nothing is known, but it makes a lot of sense to try to make this assumption and uh, see if you can get something. Also, uh, it is now known that it's enough to consider convex T. Okay, I, I already told you that it's enough to consider ellipsoids, so definitely it's enough to consider convex T up to like polylog. Um, yeah. Uh, actually, yeah, if, if, if you prove it with convex T, you prove the KLS con conjecture without a polylog. Are you going to say something about why it's enough to consider the ellipsoids of convex uh, I don't see, uh, yeah, I, I mean, I, I really don't see an easy explanation. It follows from, like, a connection with like stability of Brun Minkowski inequality. Um, Wait, so, so I yeah, I wonder if there is a good explanation, but I don't know if there is, you know, a good reduction. So you're saying it's enough to consider T being an, 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 any type of ellipsoid? The, that's enough to. It's enough. Okay, so what, like, my paper from 2013 shows that up to root log. It's enough to consider that T is any type of ellipsoid. And, and you're not assuming isotropic position for such T? And, and you are not assuming anything. It's even, it's even enough to just consider Euclidean bores. You don't need only ellipsoids. Uh, but as Shachar asked, maybe, if, maybe, we, maybe we can assume you know, a bit less. We can assume that T is just convex. And then this is equivalent to the KLS conjecture, but using like completely different things. Uh, more questions to Ronan? Well, I have one. Uh, uh, Ronan, did uh, anybody try the, this localization or needle decomposition directly for the Bourguin slicing problem? Does it make sense? Um... I don't know how to make sense of it, and I don't know of a, an attempt. Okay. It might. Like here, you, you really, yeah. Yeah, I don't know. Okay. Uh, more questions? All right, so let's thanks one again, and remember next week, so on Monday, 10.30 to 12.30. Thank you, Ronan. Thanks. <laughs>